The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. This is a fairly long reading, so be seated. And it's a story that you've heard many times, but um, I want you to imagine that you're hearing it for the first time because it's a great story, just as a story. So listen to it as a story. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Beja. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once, when Zechariah was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to offer incense. Now, at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. Then there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, because he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this to be true? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their due time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day when these things come about. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When the time of his service was ended, he went back to his own home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away my disgrace which I have endured among my people. The gospel inspired by God. So for the last two days, the scripture readings have been picking up on the very same theme, the theme of kind of uh, miraculous conceptions and miraculous births of various kinds. So I talked about it in yesterday's homily, and I gave you lots of examples from other traditions, because this is not unique to the birth of Christ. We sometimes think in Catholic tradition that the only miraculous kind of conception was the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary. But uh, literature is filled, and mythology is filled with all kinds of cases of miraculous births. And I gave you a whole list of them yesterday, including an Irish myth. It's the story of Etain who was conceived, a young girl, a princess of the realm of the fairy folk, who got conceived miraculously when she was, you know, in a previous incarnation, had been turned into a butterfly by a jealous woman, and this butterfly fell into a cup of wine that the Queen of Leinster was drinking, and the Queen drank the drink of wine with the butterfly in it and conceived and gave birth to a little baby girl. So you get it all throughout mythology. You have a story of the Buddha, that before the Buddha was conceived, his mother had a vision of being penetrated in the side by the tusk of a white elephant, and then she conceived and gave birth to the Buddha. 
And I told you the story of Zar Zarathustra. His conception happened when his mother was walking into a lake and uh, 600 years before, a prophet had deposited his seed into the lake and she conceived of the seed which was 600 years of age. I told you the story of Alexander the Great that his father was actually the god Marduk and his own, uh, who, the man who should have been his father, Philip of Macedonia, was so upset he wanted to send his wife away. So there are many, many, many instances of these extraordinary births. And today we get two of them again. The one that Mark read for us from the book of Judges, the conception of Samson, the great warrior who did battle with the Philistines. You know, that his mother was way advanced in years, you know, but she had a visitation from an angel who told her she was going to conceive. And then the second reading from Luke's Gospel, where Zechariah, the, the priest, the old, old man, a priest, and his wife, who was way beyond menopause, Elizabeth, how she conceived. And it's interesting that the messenger, although he's not named in the book of Judges, uh, was Gabriel. Gabriel was a very, very busy archangel. It's the same uh, angel Gabriel who appears to Mary, to Joseph, and to Muhammad. It was Muhammad, the angel Gabriel who appears to Muhammad uh, to tell him about his mission. So it's interesting, one of the phrases that strikes me is uh, both of them are enjoined, the two women this morning are both enjoined not to indulge in alcohol and to watch what they're eating. Now the first book uh, from Judges, Judges was written about 3,000 years ago. So it's fascinating to me that even 3,000 years ago, people had the understanding that a pregnant woman should not be drinking alcohol and should be really careful about her, her diet. It was only in the last 30 or 40 years that the psychology discovered, or medicine discovered, what's called fetal alcohol syndrome, where if a pregnant woman overindulges in alcohol, there are very, very serious re rep uh, repercussions for the baby that she's carrying. So these people had figured it out 3,000 years ago already, that you had to be, if you were going to get pregnant and you were pregnant, you'd be really careful about your diet and certainly about consuming alcoholic beverages uh, to excess. So that was interesting to me. The phrase that really caught my attention this morning as I was reading it at home was the last statement by Elizabeth where it says, God has seen fit to take away my disgrace among people. So it was regarded as a tremendous disgrace for a person not to be able to bear children, either the man or the woman. And so the notion that God was taking away her disgrace by allowing her to get pregnant, although she was way beyond menopause. And again, I've seen instances of this uh, all throughout uh, scripture and in my own experience living in, in Africa. And so uh, among the calendar people with whom I lived for many, many years, there was a, a, a tradition where if it was obvious that a man was unable to have children, it was a tremendous disgrace for him. So he would encourage his wife to go get children. And the phrase used was ovio, ovio, any way you can. And so in order to disguise the fact that the man couldn't bear kids, his wife was encouraged to go out and get pregnant any way she could. And then the child would be attributed to the man and his disgrace would be removed that he was the father of her children. If it was obvious that it was the woman who was unable to bear kids, so for instance, they practiced polygamy, so a man would have six or seven wives and, you know, seven wives, six of them got pregnant, the other one couldn't get pregnant, it was obvious it was the woman who had the issue. But there was a custom among the Kalenjin people when a woman was getting married, there was a dowry paid by the man's family to the woman's family. It went to her family because they were losing a worker and the man was gaining a worker because most of the work was done by the women. But part of that dowry was actually given to the woman herself. And if the woman proved to be barren and she couldn't have children, she would marry another woman in an actual ceremony. Now this was not a lesbian arrangement. She would marry another woman, she would give her part of the dowry uh, to this new woman and then present this woman to her husband and the children of that union would be credited to the woman who paid the dowry. And in the eyes of the, the entire village, it was the, the child that was born of that arrangement belonged to the woman who paid the dowry. Now, this goes way, way back to an Old Testament practice as well. If you remember the story of Abram and his wife Sarah, and Sarah couldn't conceive either, so what did she do? She took her own slave girl, Hagar, and she presented Hagar to her husband Abraham so that he could have children by her and they would, th those children would belong to Sarah. Until Sarah managed to conceive herself afterwards, you know, and then she rejected Hagar and sent her off into the bush uh, with her little uh, newborn baby. So this notion that somehow that the uh, barrenness is a disgrace and it can be there are remedies for it that the tribe itself can look at it. And the fi fi final thing I want to say is this, that there's a real interesting connection between 
alcohol and enlightenment, certainly overindulgence in alcohol. So not only is, are the women who are pregnant you know, advised not to indulge in alcohol and to watch their diet, but we were told that before John the Baptist was conceived, he was to, we were told that he must, he must never touch alcohol or strong drink. And so it's like, not only does the mother who is pregnant be warned against it, but the little child who is conceived is being told, you know, you're not to use alcohol in the course of your life. So what's, what's the message here? There's a very, very interesting balance between altered states of consciousness and spirituality. So for instance, within Buddhism again, Buddhism has lots of injunctions against alcohol or any kinds of drugs that change your state of consciousness. Because there are states of consciousness that are, you know, compatible with spirituality and there are states of consciousness which are incompatible with spirituality. So in other words, the message is you have to be very, very careful how you alter your state of consciousness if you're serious about your spirituality. And so there are many, many ways that we've learned, you know, through human history to alter your state of consciousness. And some of them are very compatible compatible with spiritual enlightenment and be becoming more and more self-aware and others just deaden the senses. So one of the ways they figured out very, very quickly was prayer. Prayer alters the, the sense of uh, uh, state of consciousness. Meditation alters the uh, uh, state of consciousness. Fasting alters the state of consciousness. Music does it. Dancing does it. So there are many ways that seem to alter it in a way that creates more self-awareness, you know, or more openness to spirit. And there are some ways that, do a, that change our state of consciousness, but they deaden it and kind of dumb us down and make it much more, more difficult. And so that's the fine-tuning between any substance we imbibe, whether it's, you know, a wine or it's the food we are eating. You know, the food we eat has a huge impact, you know, on what kind of states of consciousness we, we can acquire. So in navigating through all of the ways that we feed our bodies and entertain ourselves, we have to be really, really careful that what we're taking aboard is either hindering us or it is helping us. And we have to find out what is the ideal balance. In what ways can we alter our state of consciousness so that there, we're opening up to more and more self-awareness? And what uh, kinds of substances can we take or what kinds of practices can we indulge in that close us down? Right. Okay. Juliet, fire. <coughs> Well, I just think that's very interesting because, well, um, I mean, I don't drink a lot, but I have like this binge eating disorder and I, I understand what you're saying. And, and it's very interesting that you say that because, um, you know, what you put into your body does change your, alter your consciousness. And um, anyway, I, I think that's very interesting. Any other comments? Connie? I think it's, um, it's obvious when there's a polygamy mm -hmm. that either the man or the woman is, is capable of having children. But I'm curious about how they could figure that out in cases of monogamy mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't have the means to know whether it was the man or the woman. And I'm thinking about a friend of mine who was married for many years and never had children. They never went to be tested and the husband always blamed her. You live in a patriarchal society, she's always to blame. Yeah. Yeah, nothing changed. Yeah. Very simple. <laughs> Very simple. Yeah, Mark. Who are the Nazarites? Aha. Uh -huh. The Nazarites are uh, an Old Testament uh, a kind of a group that take particular kinds of vows. And so it's interesting that there's a statement, for instance, in, um, so we we're told in Luke's Gospel today that, um, um, that John is kind of in some sense a Nazarite. Uh, they don't shave their, their heads, you know, and they live in a very strict kind of diet. Paul, at some stage, you know, we're told in one of Paul's letters that Paul took a Nazarite vow himself, but he shaved his head yeah, as a symbol of it. Doing it. So, uh, in, you know, changing your physical appearance in order to kind of create a totally different persona in order to indicate a whole new sense of mission or sense of purpose. So there was a lot of practice, for instance, in, in Catholic tradition, 
uh, when, uh, when a monk was ordained or uh, took vows, very often he would be tonsured. There would be a section of the head uh, shaved bald, and they'd wear different kinds of clothes. Or when girls joined a convent, they would shave off all their hair. And so it was a symbol that the hair was a symbol of the persona, of kind of my sense of who I am. And by changing my physical appearance drastically, either by wearing a totally different kind of a, an outfit or by changing my hairstyle or whatever significantly, I was indicating a radical shift in my self-perception and in my sense of purpose and mission. And so uh, young girls going to a convent, they'd shave their heads, they would uh, get rid of their old name and they'd be assigned a new name and they'd wear different kinds of garments to indicate this is a whole new phase of this person's life. So the Nazarite vow was a kind of an Old Testament version of that where somebody was dedicating themselves to God in a new fashion, and they were going to make uh, significant physical changes, you know, to indicate that indeed they were making this change in their lives. Samson was unbeatable until the ship is hit exactly. his hair. Exactly, exactly. Yes, the story of Samson. The power. Yeah. 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 Great. Rita, you must have something to say. Yeah, I probably have a lot of things to say when it comes to addiction. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> but I might have talked to her about drugs. Okay. Uh, you know, whenever that came to light, I thought that whole lot. Yeah. So now I can look at my kids and say, those were the other money. Yeah. I mean, and obviously it doesn't have just to do with alcohol. The truth is everything we, we put into our body changes our chemistry, literally changes our chemistry, as Julia said. So that's one of the reasons why you know, a lot of people, you know, in the Eastern tradition particularly, espoused vegetarianism. That the idea of uh, e eating an animal which had been slaughtered, particularly if it had been slaughtered, you know, in a bad way, it hadn't been done kosher, that, so that taking aboard, you know, the meat of an animal that had been traumatically, you know, executed, you know, that the fear, the fear actually releases a whole kind of biochemical reaction in an animal, and so if you're uh, if you're imbibing that energy. So vegetarianism was another way that people tried to deal with this by making sure that they weren't uh, uh, not just contaminating their body, but that they weren't influencing their psyche or their soul by the energy they were taking aboard from that which they consumed. Yeah, Juliet. That's, that's very, that's, I really like that. Like, for example, I don't know, <laughs> our neighbors have this orange tree okay. and it hangs over our fence. Yeah. So I've been eating oranges. <laughs> Is your name Adam or Eve? <laughs> Um, when you eat properly um, mm. and moderation and you're eating you know, good foods so that your body really mm. nourishes the body, you mm. feel it mentally okay. and it's, it's, a whole, it's a full body yeah. Experience. Um, cleansing kind yeah. of feeling. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm a, I, feel, I feel clean, mm. I feel you know, it's just a sense of yeah. purity and correct consciousness, yeah. you know? Yeah, brilliant. So if you, if you overdo, like, with, I, don't, not, I don't know about alcohol, but overdo food, it's, um, it really, it just puts you totally out of balance. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a good feeling at all. That point. So I think there are two components. If I were to draw a graph for you, imagine a graph. Here's the y-axis, and here's the x-axis. And let's say the y-axis has to do with what you're eating. And the x-axis has to do with the mindset with which you're eating it. Yeah, the two factors are important. That the, the way in which you eat and that which you eat are both important. Obviously, the y-axis, what you're eating and putting into your body, is going to alter your biochemistry, literally your biochemistry. So there are stuff, things which are really, really good for you and things which are not good for you. But also there is the mindset with which you eat it. And so if I just kind of uh, uh, raid the refrigerator and grab a whole bunch of stuff and eat it mindlessly while I'm watching television, surfing through the channels, that's a whole different experience, even if the food is really, really good. Whereas if I'm eating mindfully and I realize that a, a, um, a meal is an extraordinarily beautifully choreographed you know, dance between two life forms. And so even if I'm eating, let's say, let's say I'm eating you know, vegetables, but I'm eating with a mindset that I'm grateful you know, for uh, the crop that sacrificed itself. I'm grateful for the ground that provided nutrients to it. I'm grateful for the sunlight to, that it used through photosynthesis. I'm grateful for the farmers who produced it, for the transporters who brought it to the shop, for the retailers who sold it to me, you know, for my mother who cooked it for me or whatever. And I'm grateful in all these ways. Then 
for me, there's a dialogue that goes on. And it's not just that the gastric juices are doing a number on a dead vegetable. It is that there are two life forms dancing. And the vegetable is now, in some senses, getting to experience a different kind of reality as a human being. It's being brought to a different level of awareness. And I'm utilizing the nutrients of the vegetable to sustain myself biochemically. So if you go back to my, my graph then, so you have um, what we're eating and how we're eating it. And the graph can climb in any direction. You can be eating very, very bad food, you know, but eating with mindfulness, and you're actually benefiting. You could be re eating really good food and eating it mindlessly, and there's not a whole lot of benefit. Obviously, the ideal is that you're eating really good food and you're eating it with a lot of mindfulness. And then, both uh, physiologically, psychologically, and spiritually, you know, there's a, a very different kind of a benefit. Yeah. Karen. To the cooking of it. Yes. So it goes into the cooking, exactly. or if you have a good fortune to be growing. Totally. Absolutely. It, it's like it starts to, to collect energy all Abs along the way. Absolutely right. And so if you even have a little vegetable garden that you're tending yourself, you know, there's a very different relationship between what you're eating from your own garden and something you just bought in the safe way because it's like you've conceived it, you've birthed it, you've nurtured it, you've fed it, you know, you've weaned it. And now you're you know, consuming it or you know, in a dialogue with it. It's a very, very different experience from just grabbing something off the shelf in Safeway that has been GMO you know, altered and then cooking it in a microwave oven while you're watching TV. It's a totally different experience. Connie? The idea of uh, using simple foods to cure illnesses yes. is where Ed did when he had Brilliant. cancer. Brilliant. For six months, he had nothing but raw foods that were done in a blender. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's amazing. That's cure. That's amazing. I have a very good friend. She's my, my own personal physician, who is a naturopathic physician. <clears throat> and her first line of you know, response always to any illness is to look at the diet and change the diet. The first response always is what we're putting into our bodies. Rita. I was wondering if that breath also uh, uh, relates to uh, the way that we have So it's like, yeah. Food is the same thing now. Yeah. Yeah. It's obviously uh, wine or, or grapes are, you know, a gift from God as well. And so it's, you know, what is the proper kind of relationship between, you know, the human body and the human psyche, you know, and uh, the fruit of the, of the grape. So it's not to say that all alcohol is wrong or, you know, it's not that at all. It is what is the balance between the nutritive value of something, you know, and the psychological impact of something. And at what stage does it get out of kilter? Mark, you were trying to get in. One important ingredient I find in eating is whether I'm alone or with somebody else. Interesting. Say more about that. Well, I think it's obvious to everybody. I think we all experience it more or less consciously. Okay. But somehow, I mean, eating is sharing or somebody makes a big right. unconscious difference. Right. That's brilliant. There's a whole branch of um, anthropology of cultural anthropology called commensality, you know, from the mensa, in the Latin means table. So commensality means sharing the table with somebody. And so anthropologists who specialize in this claim that they can go into any civilization on the planet, you know, whether it's in the middle of the, Am the Amazon Valley or it's, you know, in, in Paris. You can go into any group and by watching what they eat, what they won't eat, when they eat, whom they will eat with and whom they refuse to eat with. By just looking at that, you can determine the entire social structure of that uh, civilization. It's called commensality. Uh, literally, uh, the eating habits of a group of people are a kind of uh, a fractal of the entire social organization. Yeah. In, in France, there's a saying, excuse me, there's a saying that if you want to ask a favor of somebody, mm -hmm. there's a particular type of meal where you do that, and it's between and the cheese. Okay, say it in French for us. <laughs> say, say it in French for us. Wow. Entre le fromage et 
for that two hundred four hundred. It's a good time to, and I've, I've experienced that in my youth. When I wanted something, I went right off the bat. You know, this one. I've learned that lesson. You don't bring up anything controversial until the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. And there was. A, I just read this week that there was some research. I think it was out of John Hopkins uh, that uh, food actually can cause cancer mm -hmm. and you can actually cure yourself and, and they're finding out the cells break down different or something. Interesting. And so they are talking about that, what we eat right. that causes cancer and not causing cancer. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. That makes obvious sense. You know, we're 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 from the earth, the same earth that's producing vegetables and everything else is producing us every single cell in our body, you know, has been given to us by uh, by our mother earth. Yeah, so we're the stuff of the earth. So, I believe as well that you know that any illness that human beings can contract, that there is there is some kind of a life form on the planet, a plant or whatever, that's meant to be the antidote to it. That the plant itself is a self-contained unit, and that it has it has all the solutions to all the problems that will arise from being part, you know, being a child of this planet. It's a question of, you know, where do we look and how do we access these things. And these were the, these were the jobs of the old kind of curanderos, or the kind of the, the, the healers of the planet. And very often there were women who had this expertise on exotic plants that were the antidotes to particular illnesses in the planet. Connie. There's an extraordinary genius called Terence McKenna. He died about 10 years ago. He was an um, uh, ethnopharmological botanist who specialized in uh, plants in the Amazon Valley and, and the Amazon Basin. And he could see that because of the shrinking of the forest that a lot of these plants you know, for which there was native wisdom were being destroyed. He set up a huge big nursery in Hawaii and he took those plants and he, he would interview the, the local people and find out what, when do you use this particular plant, what is the value of it. And he started you know, uh, keeping them safe in a nursery in Hawaii so that when the Amazon got devastated, the uh, plants and the knowledge of these plants got archived in some way. Yeah. I have no idea since he died. His brother, he's got a brother, Dennis, who's still alive. I don't know if Dennis is involved with it or not, but it was a huge, big uh, archive of uh, both the plants themselves and the folklore, the medical folklore that went along with them.